Hi there, uh, I'm Leo Dannersmith from the Minnesota Medievalist and today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about my new experimental archaeology project. So this summer I've received a, another undergraduate research grant from the University of Minnesota um, through their Europe program that has allowed me to carry out a second uh, experimental archaeology project. Last time we looked at medieval travel in the 11th century through a military context. This time, we'll be looking at medieval travel in the 14th century in a civilian context. Um, I'm calling this project the practicalities of pilgrimage because though it's not specifically applicable only to pilgrimage in the 14th century, but rather 14th century travel in general, pilgrimage is a big part of travel in the 14th century and is very prominent in the sources of the time period. And so it's something that's really inspired this project. This next project um, is going to take place on the Superior Trail alongside the coast of Lake Superior in northern Minnesota. It's going to be me and three volunteers completing a journey over four days. Um, and there's going to be several things that we're going to be testing in specific on this journey, as well as just looking at what is the experience of 14th century travel more in general. So uh, I'm going to walk you through a few of those things, a few of these variable variables that we're going to be looking at in particular uh, during this video and then in the coming days there's going to be new videos with footage from the trail and uh, interviews which will be carried out at the end of every day and at the end of the project as we learn more about the experience of 14th century travel. All right. So, one of the variables we're going to be testing on this journey is shoes, period accurate shoes. Uh, these shoes are made of leather, they're soft soled, um, and perhaps one of the most important things to learn about uh, in the context of medieval travel. You're spending this whole time on your foot, I unfortunately cannot afford a horse, so <laughs> we will be traveling entirely on foot. Um, and so during this project, we're going to spend the whole time, or at least much of it, in medieval shoes and at the end learn what is it like to travel in medieval shoes. Is it that much harder? Is it easier? We'll find out. So these shoes are a big variable we're going to be looking at. Another variable, medieval baggage. Uh, this is a sausage bag. It's a kind of bag that's seen pretty well represented in the imagery and manuscripts um, from the medieval time period. There's Medieval sources don't spend an excessive amount of time talking about what kind of baggage would people have had available to. We always need to remember that medieval people only write about things that they think are really important and not about things that everybody would already know. And most people would already know what kind of baggage is available to them. So we need to really rely on images of pilgrims and travelers for this time period and this really seems like one of the kinds of bags um, that they would have used. So we're going to learn about what is it like to travel with this kind of baggage, what are the challenges of having these limitations um, when we're carrying food and supplies. Another consideration is going to be medieval tents. Um, this is a tent cloak. Uh, it is based off of the medieval cone tent. Um, you put a stick in the middle of it and you can stake it in and it becomes a tent. But it is also quite handy. For usage as a cloak. So on our journey, we're gonna learn a little bit about medieval camping. Uh, and about the usage of medieval cloaks. Um, so most pilgrims during the 14th century would have simply stayed in hostels and inns along the way. Um, but I think that it would be less immersive to go into a modern hotel than it is to camp outside. And there's actually um, a poem that I found talking about uh, the importance of being able to sleep outside in which it says that uh, a man is no fit traveling companion if he has not slept under the stars. So it is something that medieval people did, even if rarely. Um, so we're going to learn a little bit about uh, medieval camping and the use of medieval cloaks and medieval tents. So that's going to be 
another exciting thing to do. Um, I'd like to, for one, thank the English Department of the University of Minnesota for funding the purchasing of these tents because uh, my undergraduate research grant did not quite cover it. Um, and so I really appreciate uh, them and Professor Rebecca Krug from the English Department in helping me get the funding for these, uh, these cloak tents. So, uh, one of the final main variables we're going to be looking at is weapons. Uh, if you've watched any of my videos or know anything about me, you know that I do. I have an interest in weapons. Uh, I'm a fellow for the Oakshot Institute, which is a nonprofit here in Minneapolis that deals specifically with swords. And so this project was really inspired by reading the prologue of the Canterbury Tales and asking more questions about what are some of the practicalities around these journeys that they're taking. And one thing I noticed is that in the prologue of the Canterbury Tales and in other narratives around pilgrimage, there's a couple weapons um, that when pilgrims are armed or when travelers are armed seem to be what they're carrying or at least what their representative is carrying. And they are the sword and buckler, which is one-handed sword, small shield. Uh, here we have it, beautiful sword. Um, and the long bow and arrows. Uh, again, I'm I'm working with English sources for this uh, for this experiment. There might be some more variation, but particularly in the English sources, the longbow and arrows and the sword and buckler uh, are what are represented uh, as the weapons of the traveler, as the weapons of the pilgrim. And so this really brought up a question for me of why are these the weapons that they choose to show pilgrims and travelers carrying? Is it because these weapons are actually the easiest to travel with? Or is there some other societal, literary reason that these are the weapons that are chosen? So this is going to be part of my project. We're going to take along the sword and buckler, the longbow, but also a pair of weapons more associated with war. And that is the long sword, two-handed sword. Uh, this is a replica of the long sword from the 1360s. Uh, and... I don't know if you can see it, but the lance. Um, this is a 10-foot lance. This is by all means uh, not necessarily something that you just go on a leisurely walk with um, unless you need it for some reason. Um, and so we're going to be taking these weapons on the journey. Um, every day, one of the volunteers is going to have a specific weapon, and we're going to rotate through them uh, and see are these weapons that are associated with travel really easier to travel with or uh, is there something else going on here um, so all these things are going to test it and then with these projects you never know what you're going to learn the last project that i did i had an idea of what i thought i was going to learn when i set out and i did learn that but i also learned a bunch of other stuff on the side um, so I'm really excited to start this new project, ask a few new questions, and to have other people with me so I can get a greater diversity of ideas. So stay tuned for more videos from the Minnesota Medievalist, uh, and I'm really excited to share this new experience with you.